Welcome back to the MIT AI Policy Forum Summit. I hope you've been enjoying the conversations we've had so far. I'm now deeply honored to introduce a conversation between Steve Schwartzman, the chairman, CEO, and co-founder of Blackstone, and Dr. Raphael Reif, the president of MIT. Steve and Raphael's vision led to the creation of the college, which I now have the privilege of leading as dean. The college is the most significant undertaking at MIT since the 1950s, with the creation of new faculty positions and new academic programs. The college is transforming computing research and education at MIT and around the world. Stephen A. Schwartzman is chairman, CEO, and co-founder of Blackstone, one of the world's leading investment firms. Steve has been involved in all phases of Blackstone's development since its founding in 1985. He's also an active philanthropist with a history of supporting education, as well as culture and the arts. In 2020, he signed the Giving Pledge, committing to give the majority of his wealth to philanthropic causes. In both business and philanthropy, Mr. Schwartzman has dedicated himself to tackling big problems that have transformative solutions. In October 2018, he announced a foundational $350 million gift to establish the MIT Schwartzman College of Computing in order to address opportunities and challenges presented by the rise of artificial intelligence, including critical ethical and policy considerations to help ensure that technologies are employed for the common good. Since July 2012, Dr. Raphael Reif has served as the 17th president of MIT. He leads our institute's pioneering efforts to help redefine the future of higher education with a commitment to advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion. Raphael has launched initiatives to foster breakthrough research and pilot high impact solutions to address urgent changes of climate change, urgent challenges of climate change. A champion for both fundamental science and MIT's signature style of interdisciplinary problem centered research. He's also pursuing an aggressive agenda to encourage innovation and entrepreneurship. Steve, Raphael, we're eager to hear from you. Thank you for joining. AI Policy Forum. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for the introduction of Steve and me. And Steve, uh, it's a true delight and a pleasure to be joining the screen with you today. Uh, let me start with the first question, Steve. A few years ago, you decided to make AI a very important objective of your philanthropy, contributing significant resources to academia, including MIT. What drove you to AI? And how well is the world managing the emergence of such a powerful and disruptive technology? Well, thanks, Raphael. It's always great to be uh, here with you. Uh, we always have fun talking. Uh, and um, what I'd say, uh, you know, for the people who are listening, watching, uh, I I'm not a technologist. Uh, uh, you know, I'm sort of a liberal arts uh, graduate who's somehow stumbled my way uh, into the top levels of uh, scientific endeavor. Uh, and, and that happened uh, really um, uh, by accident. Uh, it was uh, because I was in uh, China on a board I'm involved with at Chenhua University. Uh, and um, there, there are many uh, very distinguished uh, uh, international people and Chinese on, on that board. and. Um, uh, one of the people was uh, Jack Ma, uh, and this must have been six years ago, something like that. And we were going to meet one of the state leaders on a bus. Uh, and um, in Beijing, when it rains, it's a lot like New York, nothing works. Uh, it takes twice as much time to get every place. And Jack and I were sitting uh, uh, in, in the front seat in back of the driver, uh, and he started talking about artificial intelligence. I had no idea. But what he was talking about. And he was talking about how different uh, people looked at uh, artificial intelligence uh, in, in the West, whether it was Elon Musk or Ginny Rometty at um, uh, IBM or Bill Gates. Uh, and each one had a different point of view, uh, uh, not on the uh, effectiveness uh, of, of the technology, but um, you know, on, on its goodness or its potential to create difficulty uh, for society at large. And, and I knew these three people 
and the idea they would have such different views, I, I found sort of um, pretty unusual. So, so I talked to them. Uh, and so I learned more. Uh, and, um, you know, as I learned more, I became aware also uh, because I was soliciting money uh, for my Schwarzman Scholars Program in China. Uh, and I'd worked my way through the real estate developers, the technology uh, uh, people, the insurance uh, entrepreneurs, and then the general uh, uh, sort of entrepreneurial class. There were some new young people who showed up, never heard of, and, and, and they were AI uh, entrepreneurs. And they started telling me about their plans, which were incredibly ambitious. And they explained that we were doing. And some of them have become uh, really monster-sized companies uh, subsequently. And I, so I was aware there was a whole commercial application uh, to, to AI. Uh, and, and, and then I, um, I ran into uh, uh, Raphael, uh, who I knew, uh, and started talking to him about it. Uh, and, and that was a further education. And, um, um, you know, he, he explained that the perception uh, that I had, uh, that I was taught by everybody who was reasonably well known in technology is that this was incredibly powerful technology was going to change the world. I was watching it change China. Uh, so it wasn't like a theory. Uh, and I said to Raphael, we, we need to do something here in the United States um, to, to keep up uh, with this uh, technology, which was also in the uh, China 2025 uh, strategic, strategic plan. Uh, and, and so Raphael came up with this wonderful idea of, um, you know, creating a new college uh, and um, creating bilinguals with half of the new faculty assigned to other uh, areas uh, at MIT so that each department would basically be covered. Uh, and that way, MIT would be the first AI-enabled uh, university in the world. I thought this was like, I thought this was a terrific uh, vision. Uh, and, and then I went through a uh, spirited negotiation, uh, and settled on some money. Raphael said they needed a, a billion one. In fact, when we started discussing this, he, he had no idea what it even would cost. Because I said, what will it cost? Which is something that every university president wants to hear. What does it cost? Uh, you know, as if somebody wants to give, uh, and so you don't even have to ask them. Uh, and he didn't even have a number. He had to go and put a program together. And so we subsequently, uh, you know, came up with, uh, you know, so, so the financing for most at this point, the vast majority of the um, billion one. So, so my um, uh, sort of uh, journey into understanding this technology really was over like a two year period and it led me on um, my own journey of trying to figure out how to make the US uh, more competitive in something I thought uh, was, was essential. Uh, and, and that resulted in uh, the recent uh, CHIPS bill, uh, which, which I've been working on uh, uh, in large part with Chuck Schumer and some people on the Republican side uh, for, for years, and sort of that ship finally got uh, to port. But I, I am a complete believer that watching this technology applied to different areas is, is a complete game changer. Uh, you know, human intelligence is pretty amazing. It, it can still do things that, that machines can't do, but there are some things that machines can do that human beings can't do. Uh, so working together, uh, you know, this is like a remarkable type of uh, partnership. Uh, so that's a long answer. I, you know, maybe you shouldn't ask another question, Raphael. Uh, but but um, that that's how uh, I got interested uh, in, in this field. And now I know a huge number of people around uh, the world uh, who, who are involved with this uh, uh, technology. And even though I still don't 
fully understand it. I, I have a really um, a much better sense of what it could do and will do. Well, Steve, this is, I think it's important for people to appreciate the journey that, that you traveled to get to where you are. And let me also add that what you mentioned in your process of education, the time that we, you and I met, that was really talking to you as a really a mutual education exercise. Uh, it was not a one-way uh, street by any by any means. Uh, let me ask you something related to that, Steve. I, one of the goals of the Schwarzen College has been to train what we call students to become bilingual, uh, which we mean fluent in computing in general and in AI in particular, as well as in their own domain of choice. So this was meant to ensure that students are preparing and being prepared for a future in which computing and AI are at the forefront of nearly every field, while at the same time, they are infused with the wisdom of other fields. Uh, why do you think that's so important? Well, I think it's important because if you could, in effect, in one person, could be able to advance, use AI technology to do what, whatever, else they're focusing on uh, as a subject matter or area of, of general focus, then, then they become, uh, you know, sort of like a equivalent of you know, football of a, you know, triple threat, uh, except it's a double threat. Uh, and and uh, uh, that, that's, that's an extremely unusual uh, person because, you know, for example, uh, a bad example, you know, if you're a history major, uh, you know, the way your brain might work wouldn't fit as well, you know, with, with uh, computer science, um, you know, so it would take an unusual person to be able to do uh, both of those. And it may be uh, that the number of true bilinguals um, is, is, is more limited than people who are trained to work together. Uh, with with people from um, the, the AI world, uh, right now people who are not in the AI world, uh, for for the most part, have no clue uh, of, of what AI can do for them, uh, and 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 so the the, the journey uh, of creating bilinguals uh, will, will in, in effect create partners as well as bilinguals, partners who, who, who can use AI once they understand uh, what it can do. So, so I think it's a very important initiative because it's really about just the acceleration uh, of knowledge, acceleration of the production uh, of knowledge, which leads to ultimately uh, insight and breakthroughs. Uh, and it's just right there. I mean, you can see it, uh, you know, it's, it talk about a helpful tool, uh, that, that's a huge underestimation, wrong language choice, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. But, but it's, it's, it's really remarkably uh, exciting uh, to, to have this type of approach. I think uh, one, one uh, I would like to comment on, on how, uh, how we are dealing with this uh, at MIT, because we, we thanks to the Schwarzman College, we, we have uh, five schools, and uh, and the college uh, cuts across all five schools, both in education and research, and and the goal is to do exactly what you're talking about: is to pr prepare graduates for a digital present, as well as for the demands of the future by educating them to be, as we describe, bilingual. Uh, and and it's important also say that we also in the college want technologists to have equal fluency in cultural values and ethical principles as they develop and use this and, and teach how to use these tools. Uh, this approach has led to blended majors, as you know, and, and they basically combine in computing uh, in a particular discipline, as well as new classes and curricula across a range of disciplines. And that, that's kind of the way the college is, is preparing and creating these bilinguals. And, and we have seen examples of uh, blended, blended majors that integrate computing and AI with molecular biology or with cognition or with economics or with urban science and planning. 
Now, all that is going on, and that's uh, the process we're using at MIT to create these uh, these bilinguals. And and what's fascinating about this is that the demand is huge. Uh, the students recognize the demand and the importance, and the demand is significant. And I, right now, I think uh, more than forty percent of our undergraduates either major in computer science alone or in a, one of these joint or blended uh, programs. And, and they recognize that this is actually that the society will demand this kind of, of, um, uh, of, uh, of, of, of preparation. And what's really, really fascinating is that in the blended majors, the other major besides AI and computer science, the other major has increased the interest significantly. In economics, for instance, they have experienced a five-fold increase in the number of majors uh, when they when, when, when the computing plus economics, the jointly blended with economics uh, was, was put together. And in brain science, that tripled the number of majors in brain science for this blended major. So uh, this has been a major, has been well accepted and well embraced by our students. And, and the students understand the market as well and the job market. And, 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 and in fact, we have seen uh, 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 the demand for this blended major. Uh, consulting and banking firms are seeking our blended economic majors and, and the health technology companies are actually seeking our blended neuroscience majors. So this little revolution, uh, Steve, that you and I thought about is actually happening significantly. And it's a, it's a, I, I believe it's a well-deserved uh, uh, well, uh, uh, enterprise that will significantly change the way we do things. Uh, but, but in that connection, Steve, I want to ask you another question. Uh, there is a, a slightly different aspect of this, which I, I think people would love to see your view. There is often debate about how much AI is right now affecting businesses, uh, the overall economy and our daily life, and whether its current impacts are being overhyped or underappreciated. Are you seeing impacts in how you operate your own business and the sectors and companies you're evaluating for potential investments? Yes, the answer is, you know, we're, we're seeing this rapidly uh, coming into use, uh, you know, for when we're buying, um, uh, you know, a, a, either a company uh, or, or, you know, a real estate uh, uh, significant sized uh, portfolio or property. Uh, we have our own, uh, you know, AI uh, area here at Blackstone. Uh, we're, we're up to 35 people. Uh, there's always uh, some uh, uh, AI analysis uh, on every purchase that we have. There's always something that we can learn better, uh, understand better uh, by tasking our data science uh, group uh, to, to investigate. Uh, and, you know, in finance generally, just to take an area that, you know, I'm familiar with, you know, the whole uh, uh, quant management, uh, you know, is, 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 you know, sort of not a new field anymore, but, you know, AI makes, makes that really uh, possible. Uh, and um, I remember when Jim Simon started uh, doing what he was doing. At Renaissance, and you know, and, you know, J J Jim used you know computer science to basically construct one of the most effective uh, money managers in history, uh, and, and so you can see um, the uh, direct application uh, of this uh, technology uh, in finance. Uh, we, we were the first people in my field, alternative assets, to do it. Now others uh, are, are following. So, so I think it's got a logical uh, progression, Raphael. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're, where it's going, because there are so many different fields uh, that, that can utilize this wherever there is data uh, of some type. Um, you know, um, I, I remember I was working on something with uh, TikTok and, um, you know, which, which had a number of um, uh, potential acquirers uh, at some point, I guess it was around 2019. Uh, and, um, you know, in one of the groups I was working with actually got inside uh, 
uh, and could see how their uh, code worked and um, what they were doing in, in, in AI uh, was like a step ahead uh, of, of whatever the rest of us were doing, which explains to some degree their enormous uh, success taking a product, inventing the product, and all of a sudden has some huge market share and changes the way people communicate. So uh, I, I, I can see this uh, happening in a lot of different places in, in China. They, they deploy it for used car sales and all kinds of other things, uh, a delivery of food and the scheduling and, um, uh, you know, along with, um, you know, the, Didi, their, their version of, uh, uh, you know, sort of our you know, car services. And so, so it's, it's marching uh, without announcement uh, in, in the commercial world and, and taking real territory. Well, in connection with that, I think, uh, let, me, let, me, let me address another different aspect of it that I'm sure the, 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 uh, since, since the public knows, people in the, in the, in the audience knows that your interest also came, came up for all the things you said, but there is an extra component here. Let me ask you about that one. Because you have been really rightly concerned uh, with the social and ethical consequences of AI deployment. Uh, and this is one area that, uh, a key area that the Schwarzman College is focused on. Do you think universities are drawing enough attention to these issues? Well, that's hard for me to answer, easier for you to answer, uh, because you're in the uh, university world. Uh, what, what I do know uh, is, is that, you know, in Oxford, for example, where, you know, I, I started, uh, you know, an AI ethics uh, uh, area, uh, there's, there's uh, enormous uh, uh, interest in that. The, the same, um, you know, at, at MIT, um, uh, and I, I think from a, um, a societal perspective, I think the media uh, is really interesting uh, in this area. Uh, I'll, I'll just give you one example why. Uh, I had somebody uh, come to my office where I'm sitting now, uh, and uh, somebody was trying to sell me um, uh, a, a product uh, in terms of deploying AI uh, in an efficient manner. And they were talking about one whole area of uh, normal corporate life. And they said, well, we, we can replace almost every person uh, here by just deploying AI. And I was <laughs> saying to myself, geez, 90% of the people are gone. Uh, and, and, you know, you would think uh, as a business person, you, you, you would say that's that's truly amazing if you could do that. Uh, as I was sitting there, I was thinking two things. One, it would be truly amazing economically if you could do that. The second thing I was thinking is, oh my God, uh, what's going to happen to all these people? Because if you replicate the proposal that this person was giving me and deploy it very widely, uh, you know, you're going to have a lot of dislocation uh, in society and dislocation has always happened economically. Uh, you always think it's too much and, and we get through those periods and you look back over 150, 200 years of economic history. Uh, but you know, when somebody just puts it right in your face, uh, you, you really say, do I wanna be part of, of doing something like that? Uh, I think it calls a question, and that has nothing to do with um, autonomous weapons or national security things and other things. So I, I think there's there's a lot to think about, if, if you will, you know, in terms of rules of road. Uh, how do we want to introduce change uh, in in our society? What what's equitable? Once you start asking questions like that, you're on treacherous terrain, because what somebody thinks is equitable, somebody else uh, won't. Uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, this is like introducing, a, you know, such a profound technology uh, that I think you really have to be sensitive uh, about that. 
and educate people who know how to use that. Uh, Steve, I have one time for one more question, and this is uh, today is uh, is a day of AI uh, policy. Uh, so let me uh, let me touch on that very briefly with you. So one one particular problem with AI policy making is that most policymakers do not have technical training, and AI is both pretty complex and is changing rapidly. The CHIPS bill that you mentioned recently passed, and by the way, I want to publicly here thank you for your immense and fairly quiet help uh, making sure that that passed. Uh, but the CHIPS bill was recently passed, and the question that I have is, are there any takeaways from those conversations about how policymakers are thinking about this topic? Well, I think um, most policymakers when they're actually focused on po policy as opposed to politics uh, are, are pretty well intentioned. Uh, but, but asking people who know relatively little about something uh, to, to, to impact a field uh, is, is pretty much fraught with danger. Uh, and uh, I, I think, uh, I, I know this is naive, uh, but it would be nice if somebody were trained to actually know something about the areas they're supposed to be legislating in, uh, and and whether they they go to MIT or one of the other great universities for catch-up courses or briefings, uh, or some kind of intensive uh, learning experience. Uh, I, I think uh, that, that, that that's the type of thing that if you were doing this in a non-political um, uh, context, and it was a company, you would definitely have your people learn everything they could before they make decisions. And, and I think, uh, uh, at least in democracies, um, because in non-democracies, they do know their, their um, domain knowledge, uh, vertical. Uh, you know, we in democracies, you know, have a little more flexibility uh, in terms of who they put in key positions and what they know. Um, but I, I think it's it, it's hard. One of the reasons why I think the chips bill took years to to pass uh, is is there weren't that many people familiar with with why you had to do this uh, type of work. Uh, chips bill isn't just about semiconductor chip, chips. It's it's got a big component on uh, artificial intelligence and quantum and you know, other you know, uh, CS uh, types of um, uh, knowledge. Uh, and and you know, it's, it, it, it took really until you know, uh, there were triggers um, to, to focus on this from, from more the uh, semiconductor perspective uh, to, re to really move this ahead. So, so it, it is an issue. Uh, even well-intentioned people who don't fully understand what they're doing can't convince the person next to them that they should do something. And, and that's that's a role that I think universities like MIT should play and participate. I, I, you know, I think uh, uh, it's almost, uh, I view that as a responsibility that we have to educate and inform policymakers. It's not that we want to advocate for a specific policy. But, but I think we should give policymakers all the information they need uh, to analyze issues and, and, and proposals and priorities. And, and I think we are doing some, we should do more. And it's not just, uh, I'm not talking about just MIT, I'm talking about universities in general. Steve, yes, so I, I, I'd say Raphael on that. I, I know we're down to the end. Uh, I, I'm on a, a board at Stanford on their human intelligence uh, initiative. and. You know, they have people that come out regularly. MIT has, you know, congressional people that come uh, regularly. I think for the great universities uh, who have that convening power and domain knowledge, it's really something uh, that, that they should be offering, uh, not just for federal uh, employees and the Congress, but, but whether it's in the, you know, the civil service, whether it's state or local, educating people uh, with the, this powerful technology so they could utilize it. They'll save money. They'll be more efficient. 
so it would be better decision makers. I think that would, that would be a terrific thing for these major universities to be doing. And, and we favor that, we're doing that, and we're gonna bring others along with us as well. Steve, thank you so very much for joining us today. Uh, I really appreciate your candor. I really appreciate everything you're doing, not just for MIT, but for the nation. The Chiefs Bill was a big deal. And what you're doing with the college is a very big deal as well. So Steve, thank you so very much for being with us today. Thanks, Raphael. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> thank you, Raphael, for such an interesting dialogue uh, on AI in the world more broadly and uh, you know, MIT's role and, and, and many other uh, important roles in that, ranging from you know, US competitiveness and the Chips and Science Act to computing bilinguals, including history majors, of which we have some at MIT, uh, to the kind of profound societal questions raised by AI. Uh, I'm sure our audience appreciates this opportunity to hear from both of you on a topic that's crucial for the future. <clears throat>